Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Labrera. I'm the head of technology for Blue Cadet, an experienced design agency in Philadelphia and New York City. And I'm very pleased to present some of our evolving thoughts on experiential design for an unknown future. Many thanks to MCN 2020 for the invitation to speak. And thank you for being here. Like all of us, I've been living in the shadow of this pandemic and reflecting on its massive effects on our work and our industry. And I struggled for a while to come up with an appropriate framing for this talk because I wanted to share how we're approaching things at Blue Cadet, but also I wanted to acknowledge the deep uncertainty of this moment. I'm currently reading Sarah Hendren's What Can a Body Do? Um, Sarah is a designer and a professor at Olin College, and her book is mostly focused on design, disability, and inclusion. But she also added this into her foreword before it got published, reflecting on the challenge and opportunity for design in this moment. And Sarah writes, is a desirable future one that only restores what was lost? Or is a new set of possibilities asking to be imagined or reimagined? We can always find ways to build a better world, even as the present one is experiencing upheaval. None of us expects this to be easy, and none of us is presumptuous enough to believe that our work can solve everything. But we can push for a more inclusive, more empathetic design instead of rushing to return to normal, whatever that might be. So this current moment has accelerated a lot of the work that organi organizations have already been doing, but it's already added tremendous urgency to that work, uh, which is often not the optimal environment for establishing clarity of purpose. So I want to set some context for what I'm presenting today. One, this is a rapidly changing time. This talk started as a collaborative article with my teammates and turned into this talk, but it's very different from what I thought it would be when I proposed it uh, at the start of um, Call for Papers by MCN. Two, I would like this to be viewed as descriptive, not prescriptive. I always put this second point into my talks. My hope is that you see this more as a collection of experiences and observations instead of a bunch of should do's or strong uh, recommendations for what you absolutely must do. And finally, I hope that this talk invites questions and dialogue. What are you all seeing in your own work? What is exciting? What things have emerged in the quiet pockets when the panic is at an ebb? I love putting out talks as a way of um, putting something out into the world and learning from my, from my peers. I've broken things out into five areas of focus. These are not mutually exclusive, and a lot of them map to long-running areas of investigation for myself and my teammates and my peers. Developing a comprehensive digital strategy, designing healthy spaces, using alternative inputs, extending the experience, and access and sustainability. There's going to be a lot of things in here that are new, but the foundation is built on things that have long been a part of my team's work. And it's just that the pandemic has forced us to evaluate everything. Um, I love this shot, by the way. It's from a neighborhood grocery store in the Philippines. And you can see the little circles where they've drawn for people to stand and the cats uh, sitting in them quietly. And I admire their commitment to social distancing, even when people have trouble following guidelines. This is still design, uh, and I love it. So let's start. Developing a comprehensive digital strategy. At Blue Cadet, we always focus on content and digital strategy. Um, it's usually our, where we begin, even when we're just ask, uh, being asked to execute a small part of a big project. And that's because if you start from a strong multi-channel digital strategy, uh, it provides a good foundation for moving in a fast and flexible fashion, even in a crisis. Uh, we often work with teams that are very focused on bringing digital within a physical exhibit context. If that physical context goes away, even temporarily, what happens? It's easier to adjust when you've already been thinking about your content existing in multiple forms through different channels. And so that's why we often talk to our clients about their content systems and say they're building content infrastructure or they're building a storytelling platform, not just building singular activations. So that's the big picture. And what are some common methods that show up over and over in multi-channel digital strategy? Well, here's a few. One, de developing a complementary online experience. And we view this as one immense area of opportunity in almost all cases. And it's not trying to replicate an in-person experience. Uh, it's creating content that considers best, how best to tell a story online. 
So the examples you'll see here, these two images, the, the top one is from, both are from work that we did with the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian for their Americans exhibit. And the online component you see at the top has a lot of overlap with the physical exhibit you see on the bottom image. Most of the artifacts are the same and the thematic structure is the same. But the online experience has a lot more room to breathe with storytelling. Uh, we help them build out these immersive stories for some of their big themes, including Thanksgiving, uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn, Pocahontas, and the Trail of Tears. And these are stories and themes that exist in the gallery setting, but online we could mix texts, images, audio, and animation to further go further into these topics um, and add depth. Another aspect is bringing stories to life using augmented reality. So this is a, a look at something we built for the Henry Ford Museum. It's their Connect app, where key parts of their collection um, are given an interactive layer. So users can explore different highlights using their, their, their mobile device. And it's important to note that there's many different ways to think about augmented reality or AR. Um, like this example, where somebody's looking at an automobile and, and you know, positioning the, the app so that highlights are brought up. You, one is you can enhance what people are experiencing in a physical space. But you can also think about AR as helping bring a physical collection into people's own space. Um, so think about being able to see collection objects in somebody's living room, for instance. Um, so that dual kind of like uh, two different modes of AR is something that we've been exploring a lot lately, especially because some of the physical experiences um, aren't open to the public. A story can also be served with um, other avenues, not just deeper exploration like you see here. So you can think of things like mini games and audio experiences. And that brings me to my last uh, tactic under digital strategy, which is audio storytelling. And a lot of our work at Blue Cadet tries to balance how much time people are spending looking down at their device. Um, and one of the, the underutilized aspects of experience is often audio. Um, and that's understandable. If you're thinking about a gallery space, you know, getting directional audio that doesn't disturb everyone in a space takes some doing. But for larger spaces, especially outdoors, thinking about your content and story in an audio context can be really, really powerful. And it can also help users stay heads up so that they're not always like constantly looking down at their device. Uh, so these are two examples of audio experiences we've developed. The top one, you see somebody walking along a raised platform. This is for the Hoover Mason trestle in um, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's at the old Bethlehem steel factory. And we created an app that, it was a web app uh, that served up audio stories from steel workers. So interviews with people who had worked at the steel factory over the years. And we tied that to different locations. And so as somebody's moving along, they can queue up these audio stories tied to a particular spot in the trestle and listen as they're looking around. The bottom image is from the recently opened Eisenhower Memorial. And we collaborated with the team to create an audio tour to accompany uh, people as they walked through the space. Uh, telling Eisenhower's story from his boyhood to his time as a soldier and a general, and finally his presidency and his legacy. It also interviewed interviews with architect Frank Gehry about the design of the memorial itself. So these are just two experiences that enhance a physical space, but audio can also be really powerful from an accessibility and an inclusion standpoint. Uh, because a lot of our content tends to rely heavily on visuals, developing audio content can also help you think about ways to include folks who might have a sight disability. Next, designing healthy spaces. I won't linger too much here because so much of this is driven by guidance on the country, city, and state level. But I wanted to touch on this because design doesn't just mean story, audio, or video and interaction. It also includes thinking about the entire user journey and experience, especially if they're visiting a physical space in this time. So one of the ways of doing this is uh, first creating a more granular and dynamic crowd management approach. Uh, while this largely has to do with physical design, and so there's some limitations there, we also tend to think of this as an opportunity um, to 
to think about how to spread out crowds um, or how to deliver content to them in a meaningful way while they're waiting. Um, they're already invested. They're at your physical location. Um, hopefully they're not distracted. How can we give them relevant content while they wait? Um, so different ways of doing um, this sort of queue management range from individual only immersive experiences, uh, like the top left, a single person gallery in, in, in Japan, or the top right, like uh, Disney's AR app, which automatically scales games to, to wait time um, and activates uh, fun um, AR moments uh, based on the physical environment around the user. It's also uh, worth considering, you know, more classic ways of organizing queuing, um, like onboarding films or breakout areas. Uh, so you see those in the bottom left and bottom right, uh, where people can explore individually before going on to the next room. Um, and that helps prevent traffic jams um, as they move through the space. Two, uh, think about replacing queues with notifications and SMS to let visitors know when they can enter or move through the space. Can you use SMS, for example, to queue people up and let them know when it's safe to, to enter or proceed? Um, or you could use push notifications. So the top image is from some strategy work we did with the Man Center. It's a performing uh, arts uh, space here in Philadelphia. And we were imagining how we could use push notifications to notify people of different things. For example, the wait time at the con uh, concession stand at the top of the hill. Um, going back to SMS, my barber does queue management uh, using SMS. And they do all bookings and payment online. But when it comes to the day of your appointment, they send SMS messages when you should head to your appointment. And because they're strictly limiting the number of people indoors, they send you a second SMS while you're waiting outside, letting you know when it's safe to enter. I'll touch on this a bit more later when talking about user devices, but we've seen in the restaurant industry, uh, people lean heavily on this with outdoor, uh, leaning heavily on this type of uh, technique with outdoor dining, um, especially with menus and payment. So the bottom image is somebody scanning a QR code uh, with their mobile device, um, and using that person's device uh, can help uh, avoid uh, and reduce uh, personal and physical interaction. Using alternative inputs. Now, for a long time, touchscreens have been one of the default solutions to integrate digital experiences into physical spaces. And their ubiquity has always been a challenge to us here at Blue Cadet. You know, we're really good at making those types of experiences. But even before this crisis, we wanted to make sure that we spent a lot of time thinking about alternatives to touch, uh, partly because we want to make sure we're using the right interaction model, uh, and also partly because we want folks to feel a sense of wonder and curiosity about what they're interacting with. So first, um, thinking about uh, we've been cataloging different ways museums and brands have been using visitor devices to receive content or to drive the experience. Some of what we've observed is older technology finding a refined use. So in this exam, these two examples you see on the top one is a mobile guide for the Whitney Museum. Um, and QR codes have been around for a long time, but it's only been the last few mobile OS generations that we've had good native support for them. So when, on most newer Android and iOS devices, you just point at a QR code and they'll send you to the destination. And that reduction of friction is why lots of organizations are, are using them again uh, to reduce physical interaction, uh, but also get user to the information that they can then browse, whether that's um, wayfinding information or interpretive information if they're looking at an artifact in a space. Uh, we've also noticed some brands, let me just move this back. We've also noticed some brands uh, using Apple's AirDrop functionality to suggest continent apps uh, by uh, using proximity. Um, ESPN notably ran a marketing campaign around the NBA finals in New York City. Um, and it basically just triggered some messaging and content if people were in specific zones, like on a bench. And there was a joke about, why are you on the bench when LeBron is in the game? Um, watch the NBA finals. Um, so you can think of different creative ways to use uh, something like AirDrop as well. 
Uh, the other scenario not pictured here is having the user's device act as their remote control to the experience. So using web sockets to have either an individual or multiple users control an interactive in a public space. This allows them to drive the experience and stay you know, safely distanced and not necessarily be touching um, a touchscreen interactive. This is something that you see uh, with multiplayer games online, like a, a Jackbox or a Kahoot. To incorporate zero touch technology, we've been continually experimenting with gestural input through the years. And this can take so many forms, like face and head tracking, as you see in the top left, hand and gesture tracking, uh, the bottom left, and skeleton tracking, the top right and bottom left images. And we've noticed a few things. One is that the experience should drive your interaction model. Um, is the user seated or standing? Are they likely to be alone or in a group? And two, prototyping your input quickly is essential. So we use lots of different tools from JavaScript to open, open frameworks to Unity, sometimes in combination with machine learning. Um, there's machine learning libraries to interpret user expressions, for example, and trigger interaction based on them. And these are all visually driven examples that I've got up here, but let's not forget about voice or sound input as well. Um, those are some things that we've been exploring too. Once you've prototyped, you can start to get into more complex interactions. So I'm showing here two examples that are a little bit further along from the rough demos and prototypes on, on the previous slide. And this, these are two camera vision experiments from my teammate, Adiel. And in the first, Adiel's body position and gestures help drive this interactive painting-like exploration. And you know we're playing with position, uh, two-handed and single-handed uh, gestures and seeing what, you know, what we can recognize and what interactions we can drive off of that. In the second, we were asking ourselves what intuitive gestures exist for viewing content and perhaps zooming into them. So we settled on a binoculars metaphor. You know, holding up your hands to your face would activate the binoculars with a slightly zoomed in view. But then in addition to that, by examining the angle of your arms, we could zoom in and out for finer control to zoom in and out within that, within that view. And finally, in terms of alternative inputs, maybe it's more practical like this. Uh, maybe you have an existing experience that you just need to keep running. Uh, and this photo from IDM shows people driving a touch table using a stylus. So consider recyclable styluses. Uh, they might just be a good way to use, help users um, use your interactive in the short term, um, combining that with good cleaning and ventilation practices in your space. Extending the experience. There's many different ways to think about extending a public experience. Um, and they overlap with many of the techniques that we've already covered. I want to take us back to our opening section about having a strong digital strategy, because that's going to be important in helping you decide which ways you hope to accomplish this. Are you bringing a physical experience into an online or private space? Are you layering an experience on top of a, a physical installation or something out in public space? Or are you opening up new ways to look at a collection online? This first example is to embrace uh, different forms of virtual spaces. We've been toying with the idea of digital spaces that aren't centered on low latency video chat, because not everything fits neatly into a meeting-centric tool like Zoom. So in the top example, you can see a virtual water cooler space that my teammate Chris has um, been prototyping. And you have different avatars uh, spread throughout the space and trees and little chairs. And as you move through, um, there's ambient music driven by the location within the space. So we're playing with proximity as well. Um, you can customize your avatar. Chris even put a headphone option in just for me, uh, which I much appreciated. And then uh, a, a final layer on top of this is we were playing with chat and seeing if that made a you know, was a good experience for a space like this. And this is all built with JavaScript, uh, the 3JS library. And we've noticed other uh, places as well in events experimenting with this type of 3D space for conferences. The bottom example is from a conference on roguelike fantasy role-playing games. I'm not much of a gamer, uh, although some of my teammates are. Uh, but 
the post-conference uh, conversation around this um, event caught my eye because the organizers had decided to hold the conference in a multi-user domain or a MUD. And it's been a while since I've been in a MUD and interacted in one, but so many of the hallmarks make sense. It's low bandwidth, it's low latency, uh, it's text-driven, you know, with commands for navigating between rooms. And it's just really interesting how this lo-fi world can still foster a sense of intimacy with all the attendees. And they were just raving about the experience on Twitter. We loved reimagining virtual space so much that it was the subject of a couple of months of research and development at Blue Cadet, creating tech demos, making design prototypes. We loosely approached a lot of things under the banner of telepresence, but here's a look at four screens from some work we did around imagining what a digital event could be like. Um, the top left, we asked, what does onboarding or welcoming look like when you first log in? Um, typically, when you first join a meeting in Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Google Meet, there isn't a lot of breathing time before you dive right in, and it, it can be a little chaotic. Top Left imagines uh, attendees to an event choosing different topics that they're interested in before they actually enter uh, the lobby. Uh, the lobby is uh, envisioned in the top right image. Um, and it gives users a lay of the land and helps them see the different events that are going on at the same time so that they can choose which one to attend. The bottom left um, came out of um, just a prompt about collaboration. Um, collaboration over screen share is typically cumbersome. So we asked, how do multiple people interact with something, you know, in this case, a 3D model, uh, and do that simultaneously while chatting with their presenter? We thought an interface where multiple users could pin questions to the 3D model, for example, uh, while seeing their fellow participants, you know, moving and interacting in the same space, uh, might make for a more engaging Q&A environment. Uh, we took some inspiration from tools like Mural, which allows you to uh, see your teammates' cursors uh, moving about in the same space uh, for this one. And finally, at the bottom right, we, we asked, what does a happy hour online, a better happy hour online look like? Uh, Zoom has breakout rooms, but we wanted to envision something more organic, where you could freely exit and enter rooms. And as you move through the spaces, your proximity affected the video and audio that you, that you would see and hear. So we also thought about a recharge zone. That's what you see on the right, uh, the right of that screen where um, we were pulling back some of our uh, prototyping around gesture recognition to create fun animations so that when people waved or gave a thumbs up, um, it triggered some emoji animations um, just to inject more of a human element to people's video windows. Uh, second, meet people where they already are. So this can mean like the top, um, creating an AR experience, an AR layer on top of artists' works in public space. It could be like the bottom left where, you know, a poster or something printed is uh, given an AR experience to, you know, in this case, it's adding sparkles to a Christmas tree. Or it could be something like the bottom right. Um, Minecraft is already home to students recreating their schools in the environment, uh, so why not museums as well? I think this example is MIT, but I do know that some students at UPenn, uh, UPenn also did it. And for what it's worth, my eldest daughter held her most recent birthday in her friend's Minecraft realm. You know, they created um, present, uh, they made presents and built different spaces for her in Minecraft before the party. Finally, another area of continuing investigation for us is applying machine learning models to collections. And this can help visitors as well as curators and researchers explore these large collections more effectively. So the top is some work that we did with the Henry Ford Museum, um, just running a lot of their collection through this model and finding affinities in terms of shape and size and, and color. And museums have spent years digitizing their collections, but machine learning finally provides tools to make the information more accessible. And that can be just browsing through um, different ways of moving through the collection, again, by um, physical hallmarks or juxtaposing, juxtaposing different qualities. Or it can be used to drive something like a Slack application or an Instagram filter. You know, we've, we've seen examples of, you know, what, what kind of artwork matches, you know, your visual appearance, for example. Um, and you can also do things like generate 
uh, or find uh, two different objects and uh, find a path between them through the collection. So those are some of the examples on the bottom two images, uh, which creates some for some fun surprises in a collection. Finally, access and sustainability. I've just shown a lot of tech first tactics and there's a whole menu of very shiny things that I can talk to you about. But I want to end with this section because underneath all of this is a primary concern of mine, which is how do we make sure that the emerging experiences we design don't replicate how our physical spaces can sometimes shut out access for many people along intersections of disability, race, or class, or some combination of those, those three. This is a chart from Pew Research from last year about the percentage of US people primarily accessing the internet through their smartphone. And the number is really high. It's 37% uh, primarily. That's their primary device for getting online. And a quarter, 27%, it's not on the chart, but a quarter of uh, people do not have home bro uh, broadband. They strictly use their, their phone to get online. And so in a time when most folks in the United States are still largely remote, um, this just has implications for the type of uh, online experiences we can build and virtual experiences we can build. Um, can we make low bandwidth ones that don't um, run up <laughs> overages on people's uh, cell phone plans or that are faster to download on slower cell networks? Um, there's a whole host of equity and inclusion um, considerations um, that come, come into play when you get into a crisis like we're experiencing right now. Two, how do we balance new experiences with more familiar ones? Um, it's always worth asking yourself, uh, should this just be a web page? Uh, my teammate Chris sent me this tweet uh, quite a while ago from Dr. Mia Ridge, who is a digital curator with the British Library. She was responding to uh, just a prompt about digital experiences in general, but she writes, I think also there hasn't been mass public demand for entirely new types of experiences. Social media does a good job of sharing short form content. And it's not entirely clear whether people want more experiences with a longer dwell time and more complicated setup than web pages. And I will tell you that this tweet haunts me. I think about it at least once a week, if not more. Um, and it's a great corrective to the shiny object mode I often find myself in as a technologist who is excited by all these different storytelling tools. And three, how do we balance maintenance and care with making new things? I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here because most of the folks I encounter in the museum world are already balancing these priorities. Uh, just two quick examples. I'm updating an app that I last compiled seven years ago. It was built with Flash. You see the logo at the top here. And Flash doesn't even technically exist anymore. It's now called Adobe Animate. And the bottom image is uh, just the Apple's App Store logo. And Apple's App Store will remove your app unless you keep it up to date with the latest version of the OS. So have you budgeted for that? And if you're only thinking of your content through these singular experiences, are you limiting your flexibility in a crisis or you know, just with the slow march of time? I'll bookend my opening quote by Sarah Hendren by invoking one of her own Olin College colleagues. Uh, Deb Chatra, who is a writer and professor of engineering. And Deb focuses a lot of her work on infrastructure. She often examines the divide in popular culture between making, you know, as a like capital M making versus repairing or maintaining or caregiving, with these latter things being strongly gendered as female and thus given less time, money, and attention. But caregiving is essential to making things sturdy, especially in a crisis. Uh, so Deb has used this chart before. I've, I've mostly seen it in screenshot form, but I've redrawn it here for clarity. And you have this in uh, these four qualities that all play against each other. Resilient, sustainable, equitable, maintainable, these are all key words for the work that we do, and these are hallmarks of what we want to build. So perhaps it's good to ask, is making new things the only way we can deal with crisis? What can we do to make our content embody these characteristics? Not just our content, I guess, but our experiences. So some thoughts to close. This could mean making metadata more consistent across a collection. 
It could mean formulating high-level goals on equity and sustainability for your organization. It could mean budgeting for the care and tending of what you already have, even as you plan for new things. I hope that some of what I've shared today has been helpful, and I'm really looking forward to the live Q&A. Thanks again, MCN.